I do want to share some things out of the book of Colossians chapter 1. If you look there, we had a wonderful time, has been said already, in the uh, ordination council meeting. And that's just a, a good time when uh, almost always when ordained preachers get together and, and talk to one of their own and challenge one of their own and ask questions of one of their own. Uh, and it is grueling. And you are kind of glad there's no one else there kind of looking on uh, seeing the sweat come down your face and, and seeing the hesitations. And, but uh, Pastor Tim did extremely well with uh, all the— there was one question he really fumbled on. I probably shouldn't say anything about it, but one of the men there asked him how you could be a conservative fundamentalist and wear the socks you do. But he, he, had, a, he had a good answer uh, for it that it came up to. But, he fumbled around with that one, but uh, the guys accepted his explanation, and, <clears throat> and it worked out. Colossians, I want to share some quick thoughts out of the book of Colossians. Uh, it has been a great joy for us to be here with you folk. Uh, it, honestly, it's wonderful when you see a church that's still staying by the stuff. I mean, everybody seems like, I mean, church majority now, it seems like, of our good, fundamental, independent Baptist churches just seem like they're going down the wrong road. It just seem like there's been a turn in the road, and they're all jumping on it for one major reason, and that's because they want more people. And they think if they compromise everything they've been taught, uh, then they'll get more people because we want to bring the Lord's testimony and holiness down to their level of the world so the world can come on and not be offended by the sword that's being uh, used there from the pulpit. But I think we don't want to water down the message of God. Uh, we want to continue on as a, from a Moses to a Joshua and, and keep the same thing going. They don't have to change because there's a new generation around. Uh, the Lord's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we all just keep things that way uh, as well. Colossians chapter 1. Read, I'd like to read beginning in verse 1, <clears throat> several verses here, but look in verse 1 of Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God tonight that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And we know, Lord, that your Word is a sharp, two-edged sword. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will be experienced with it, that, Lord, we'll sharpen the sword constantly, that, Lord, we'll make certain that as we wield the sword, that we do it graciously but boldly taking our stand for Christ. I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Tim and for his wife, Kayla, and just pray your continued blessings upon them and the ministry that you have for them yet in the future. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness thus far, and pray you'll continue to bless. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I want us to take a, night, a, a, a time tonight to kind of look at the future to see what may be out there and some of the things for each one of us. All of us have a ministry of some kind, and we think about the ministry for each of us that God has involved. Some of us are not, some of you are not called into the ministry in a full-time capacity, as Pastor Tim has been, but everyone has something to do for the Lord as part of the body of Christ here at Volusia County Baptist Church. And I look and I think about the, the work of the Lord, and I think about ministering that each of us is responsible to God and accountable to the Lord for what we do and what God does through our lives as well. I have, 
I've <clears throat> given a lot of thought before about things that kind of keep us going in the ministry. There are a lot of men and their wives that start out, as Pastor Tim is doing and his wife, and a lot of men start out, but they kind of throw in the towel along the way. They kind of give up. We've all seen them. We've all seen men of God that are true men of God. But I remind us, the ministry is not for sissies. It's not for novices. It's not for people that don't have stick to -itiveness. It's not for people that are willing to give up and throw in the towel. I mean, it takes a lot to keep going uh, and to keep going forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank the Lord for the Word of God that we have that gives us that motivation to keep going and honestly serving the Lord. The Apostle Paul, though he didn't start this church, was writing them concerning their ministry. And he commends the people there at the church at Colossae uh, for their love of the Lord and their hope as well. Notice, if you would, in verse 4, where he said, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And keep in mind, without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. So he said, we're so grateful to hear about your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So he's commending them <clears throat> for their faith, these people. Uh, he's commending them for the word of God working in their lives, for the gospel, the truth of the gospel, and the love that they have for others as well. Paul will also mention that he and Timothy were grateful for the fine teaching that these people were getting from their faithful pastor, Epaphras, who was continually preaching the word for these people to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Elsewhere in the Bible, not just here, but elsewhere in the Bible, we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, qualifications for men of God to be in the ministry. You don't just volunteer for it in the sense that, hey, why not? There's nothing else to do. Uh, but, but God has to be involved in the calling, as, as uh, Brother Tim mentioned earlier. But I think anyone going into the ministry, it's vitally important that we settle in our hearts and minds what God wants qualification-wise. As I look at the qualifications there in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, they're about, they're, as, as I counted them, there were like 16 different qualifications that were there. All but two of them had to do with a man's character. I thought earlier today, I thought, my goodness, can you imagine being born in the Sears family if you didn't know how to sing? I mean, that'd have been, a, I mean, you'd have been the outcast immediately, you know. Uh, I mean, that, they would not have loved you. You would have, you'd have been embarrassment to them. You'd have been, and I thought, I'm so glad that God saw fit not to allow me to be part of that group, because uh, uh, I can't sing at all. But you know, everybody has their gift and their abilities and their talents, and God wants to use everyone for the work of the Lord as well. But it's character that God's looking for. It's somebody that's made of the right stuff that they realize that, hey, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. There's nothing good in me. And whatever good ever comes about through me is because of the Lord. And we thank the Lord. So it's that learning to depend on God, walking in the Spirit, which is so vitally important for each of us to have uh, the confidence we have in the Lord and serving Him. After I got saved, I was called in the ministry. I was a student down at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, and, uh, and then God called me in a little church down there, and I switched over from schools and trained for the ministry to prepare and I realized then this is the most wonderful thing in the world to be involved in. After I got saved and married a person responsible for my salvation uh, and then got a call of God to be in the ministry, uh, it's been so wonderful serving the Lord in the ministry. And you're looking at someone who loves the Lord, loves life, and loves the ministry. I've always loved the ministry, but that doesn't mean we haven't gone through our hardships and tough times in it because they are there. And I know being in the ministry as long as you have already, you've experienced some of those times, I am sure, where you get home at night and think, you know, I wish I'd have done this differently, or I wish this wouldn't have happened, or I wish we could have gotten to the heart of that person and, and kept them going on fire for the Lord. But the Bible talks about loving life, you know, that <clears throat> the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. 
But the Lord said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So I want to share a few things about the abundant life and about the ministry and about uh, keeping on for the Lord as you look to the future as to what God's keys to the future, keys to be able to help you going forward for God, keys to be able to help both of y'all in the ministry and serving the Lord and giving God your very best. And so as we learn to love life and as we have the heart that these people had at the church at Colossae, where they had the love which you have to all the saints and our love for the saints and love for God because it's important for all of us. But I've got a few things you might want to keep track of for yourself, think through, and for all of us to give thought to whatever your ministry might be as far as working for the Lord in the Sunday school or as a deacon or as a teacher or a bus ministry or a visitation ministry or <clears throat> knocking on doors, anything. These are a few things to keep in mind. Number one is I'd say to Pastor Tim, love your challenge. Love your challenge. The ministry, <clears throat> you'll soon discover, has many challenges. I mean, even the things you go through as, as a young man. And again, not knowing specifically or exactly what your future holds. I mean, no one really knows. I mean, how long will you be doing what you're doing? And there are different positions and places. You came across so extremely well the ordination council that, hey, I'm right in the will of God, and I'm not in a second man's position. I'm in the position that God has for you. That's key. And so being content with where you are and what God is doing for you, and however he leads you, there'll be challenges out there no matter what you are doing. Uh, we think of working with teenagers or working with single adults uh, or working with adults or working with babies, <clears throat> Uh, nursery, I mean, school, there's so many different aspects of the ministry, and that honestly is one of the things that is such a blessing for men of God, because we don't ever have two days exactly the same. They're always a little bit different. There's always something different, someone different, uh, and that we all have to deal with. And you have to deal with those things. So I say, love your challenge that is there. I had, it may be in here tonight. Uh, but I had a gentleman come up to me, and honestly, he was very sincere. And as he was leaving this morning, he said, I've, I've got to ask your forgiveness for something. He said, because I fell asleep while you were preaching. <clears throat> and I thought, I've never had an honest person that honest in my life come up to me. That was the first for me to hear that. And I told him, I said, well, I heard about one time before in somebody else's ministry where a guy fell asleep, <clears throat> uh, and uh, the preacher was there and said, hey, lady, wake, wake your husband up, wake your husband up. And she looked up and said, you wake him up. You put him to sleep. <laughs> so, I thought, so, hey, I didn't mess with that. I said, look, sir, don't, don't worry about it. I said, it's my fault if you fell asleep. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. But I'm saying, you don't ever know what comes up in the ministry. I mean, it's there. You know, I mean, things happen. So we want to love the challenge that is there because I, don't ever get to the place where I can't believe it or I'm frustrated with it. or blah. You just, you learn to work through it and you keep on going no matter what because the greatest of all challenges is whether or not you will remain faithful to God. That's the key. And notice if you would there where he said in verse 7, as he also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is for you a and you ought to underline it in your Bible, a faithful minister of Christ. Not any kind of minister, because there are plenty of them out there, but a faithful minister for Jesus Christ. We're all familiar with the verse that says, moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. Faithful and faithfully serving. And that's why he tells Epaphras, hey, you're doing a good job there. Stay at it. Stay faithful in 1 Corinthians 4, 2. And that's true of every servant of the Lord, but especially for a pastor, especially for, because you've got people out here that are looking at your life. You've got young people right now that are looking at your life and adults that are looking at your life. And all it takes is the devil to get in there and trip us up one time, and that's what they will remember about us for a long time. So I say, be faithful, stay with it. Thank God uh, for the prayers of your people as well. For anyone who's in the ministry any length of time, any pastor uh, cherishes the prayers of his people when they pray for him. And don't ever forget to pray for your pastor 
and your pastors and the pastoral staff and these men of God because they all need it. You think you get attacked by the devil. You try leading God's people and see how the attacks increase so greatly. Uh, so you always want to make sure we keep praying for the pastors. But faithfulness implies a commitment that is there to the ministry, to my calling that God's given me, that, Lord, I'm not backing off for anything at all. I want to keep on going until Jesus comes back. And it takes a, a time, and it takes fruit, uh, and, and time to build the fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. But you give yourself to it uh, and continue on. I like what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. He said, look, Timothy, he said, I'll tell you, he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me and counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry putting me into the ministry in 1 Timothy 1.12. And that's <clears throat> what it takes to get us in the ministry, and that's what it will take to keep us in the ministry. Faithfulness, faithfulness. So if they stay faithful, <clears throat> love the challenge that is there. Faithfulness. Lord, if I can just be that faithful servant of God, I'll be very thankful and grateful to Almighty God for it as well. So for both of you and your family and, the, and your children and future children, however God blesses you, Stay faithful. Just plug along no matter what. Stay faithful. You'll get ahead that way, and you keep on going for God that way. A second thing, not only love your challenge, but love your charter as well. Now, let me give you the Random House College Dictionary definition of a charter, and then I'm going to insert a little interpretation of my editing along the way. Here's what it says. It says, definition of charter. A document, hey, I'm going to tell you about the document that we have right here. It's the Holy Word of God. He said it's a document issued by a sovereign, yeah. Almighty God, outlining the condition under which a corporate body, church, is organized. Authorization from a central organization, heaven to establish a new branch, another church. And I think, hey, that's just perfect. That's exactly what God wants for all of us as men of God. And I think even as you deal with young people, you see them get saved and praise the Lord for it. Or adults, you see them get saved and praise the Lord for it. But you say, God, please call one of them into the ministry. Lord, please call them in. And Lord, help us to, to train them and bring them up in the Word of God. And that someday... As you call them, we can send them out to go start another church out there for the glory of God, something you were talking about uh, in the meeting this afternoon as well. But I say, love your charter. Love the Bible. As Paul told young Timothy, preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And by the way, you'll never run out of material to preach as long as you keep this book right by your side. Uh, and it is valuable. And I said in the Sunday school class this morning, and I say it, I mean it with great meaning, for 35 years of pastoring, the hardest thing I ever did was preparing three brand new messages every week uh, besides the Sunday school. But I say it takes it. It's work. It's labor. You stay with it. <clears throat> it's your charter as the Word of God. And so I say, love the Bible, because people can only live so long with, with a diet of pablum uh, in the mornings and keeping them going, and it's the little stuff, but it, it's a must for a preacher. I remember when I was a college student, I had just been saved a couple of years, and there was a man on campus that had preached in chapel. His name was Dr. Charles Woodbridge. Dr. Woodbridge was a, a brilliant man. Uh, he, had, he had already written a, uh, a Bible doctrines book uh, that I had had, and a, a, just a keen man. And I, I saw him walking. He walked very quickly as he was walking across campus. And I went up to him. I said, Dr. Woodbridge, I said, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? He said, nope, as long as you can keep on walking, because he just wanted to walk and exercise. So I kept walking beside him. And I said, can you give me, <clears throat> give me a thought for this, Dr. Woodbridge, I said, if there were one thing you could give me as a young preacher, I hadn't even started in the ministry yet, I'm still a student. If there's one thing you could give me as a young man going into the ministry, what would that one piece of advice be? And just like that, he said, 
I tell you exactly the one piece of advice, and that is master the book. Master the book. And I thought, wow, it's that important? I'd only been saved a couple years. You mean it's that important? And I realized more than ever, yes, it's that important for men of God to master the book because when you have this Bible mastered in your heart, and by the way, I'm still working on it. I haven't totally mastered it, so don't get me wrong. But I'm saying you have that love for the Word of God. Like the psalmist said, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Or the Joshua said, you know, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success in Joshua 1.8. So I want to say, I say, master the book. Love your charter. Love the Word of God uh, that is there. Immerse yourself in it every day. Make sure you have those <clears throat> daily devotion, devotional time in the Word of God, that you work at it and love the Word and love, love the Lord and love what He had to say in it. So stay with it. Make sure it's vital part of it. You, and you don't need to be told this, but I remind you, the Bible is greatly under attack today. So stand with it. No matter what, just don't bow down to anybody else. You bow down to the Lord and His Holy Word. It's God's charter. So <clears throat> love that charter. So love your challenge. It's going to be there. The challenge will always be there in the ministry. Love your charter, the Word of God. Just stay in it all the time and make it important part, a vital part of your life. Where, as Job said, neither have I gone back from the commandments of thy lips, he said, but I've esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. And so I say, stay in it. He said, look, I'd rather have the Word of God than I would corn grits and bacon and eggs. They said, I want the Word of God. And he said, that's what I want, and he longed for as well. So <clears throat> stay in the Bible. Love your charter. Love the Word of God. Preach the Word constantly. And a third thing I'd say that's important to love <clears throat> is to love your companion. God has wonderfully blessed you, and I'm going to ask you to hold your finger there for a minute and look back over in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. So you find Matthew, everybody, and back up one book in the book of Malachi. At least that's how I find it. Uh, but go back into Malachi in chapter 2, and I want you to just remind you of something that I know you already know, but something that really is important as well. In Malachi chapter 2, <clears throat> Notice what Malachi is saying to these dear people. <clears throat> uh, because of the Word of God and because of what they were doing and trespassing God's commands, he said in verse 11, if you look there, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married a daughter of a strange, strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, that is everybody, out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, oh, wherefore? And here's what he said, because the Lord had been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. I remind all of us tonight that marriage is about companionship. It is <clears throat> accepting God's choice in my life for my wife or for your husband. <clears throat> and it's companionship. It's a togetherness. And when you go into the ministry, it's not like one man's in the ministry and the wife isn't. It's a we proposition Amen. when you go into the ministry. It's two people. Now, uh, certainly, when you think about ministry, it requires both of you, requires your children, that you already know what it's like to kind of live in the proverbial glass house that's out there as a preacher's kid. Uh, and it's true. And there's a lot of expectations there upon you. But I'd say 
Just stay faithful to God. Keep the family secure in Jesus Christ because that's vitally important. You know, as a, as a, if you had any other job out there, if you had a job out there, you can have a rough home life and still keep your job going. It just doesn't work in the ministry at all. You have to make sure that we have that constant companionship that is there. I hate to admit this, but I will right now. It's not on my notes, but I'll say it to you. I remember our church was probably five or six years old, and I was in our first building that we had, and I was sitting up on the platform, and I was kind of miserable as I looked down at my wife sitting there in the front row, and she played the piano as well. And I was thinking, as we're singing a congregational hymn, I was thinking, I left this morning with an unresolved problem. And I thought, I know my wife's not happy, and I know I'm not happy. And I said, Lord, everybody's singing, you know, while I'm thinking this, you know, smiling away, you know. I think, Lord, if you get me through this one sermon, I promise I'll never go to the pulpit again with an unresolved problem. That was back in 1974, 1975. I've never done it since then because it doesn't work. Uh, a wife is that, I'm the love of my wife as Christ loves the church. And that is a sacrificial, totally giving love. And I think, and by the way, Kayla, take advantage of that comment tonight afterwards just to get whatever else you're looking for because <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Tim will have a weak heart right now. You know, but, but I think our companionship is so vitally important. And don't, don't ever lose that. Don't ever lose it. Don't ever get a, a his and her situation going. Or you just, you do it together. You work together. You love together. You serve together. The companionship together is vitally important uh, for both of you. And I think it's just uh, the kind of thing that God wants all of us to have in our marriages, in our homes, that we are one in Christ. The most important doctrine on marriage in the Bible was the one started out in Genesis uh, 2 or 3 and goes three other times in the Bible. And that is, wherefore shall man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That's mentioned four times in the Bible. It only takes once to be vitally important to get in this book. But he said it four times. So that means cleave unto that. Uh, and, as, and as Wayne Mack said, wrote good books on marriage, he said, you know, there is the leaving, the weaving, and the cleaving. And you make sure it's the togetherness, the companionship that's vitally important. Uh, so that that way you can have the ministry. And that goes both ways for the wife as well. Uh, to make sure that we do, you do your part in having that companionship that is there and, and um, with the children. And making sure the steak and lobster every night is there and the grits. And... <laughs> making sure the kids are perfectly clean and never cry and never say anything while your husband is home. Uh, so, so that uh, when you get to heaven, keep that in mind because that, that'll work out better there. But I mean, it's so, it's so vitally important. And you know, I'm saying make sure you take the time together for that companionship as well, which is really, really important uh, for everyone. And then make sure as well that you not only love, <clears throat> love them, but I'd say loving your companion but don't forget to love your congregation. Being a pastor and being in the ministry is not a position for a hireling at all. You're called of God to serve people, uh, your people, the best people in the world that you have right here at Volusia County Baptist Church. You serve the Lord with them. And love goes a long way, as he talked about in verse 4 of our text. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. And that's so important for all of us but particularly for men of God in the ministry. And love goes a long way when your, your people know you love them. If they're like mine were, they'll love you back. And I'm sure they are. And, and they overlook a lot of our other deficiencies uh, when, you know, when they know that you love them. Uh, and and that, that's so important for us as well because, you know, sometimes people think that pastors or preachers are kind of, made out of a different mold, but we're just like anybody else. We're just as ungodly and sinful and wicked apart from Christ as anyone is. Uh, and we have the capacity for all of those things. But thank God for the prayers of God's people and working together 
that people can be patient. And I found out that people can be very forgiving of us as pastors uh, if we treat them properly and love them <clears throat> in the work. So I say, make sure you love your congregation. I remind you that, <clears throat> that uh, everybody has problems, but you just keep working at the problems, whatever it is in a church. I say in a church in itself, work out the problems immediately. Don't ever let them fester but you just go after it. You go to that person. You go to the young person, whatever it is. And, and we all have them, as I was talking about this morning. We all have them, <clears throat> but we want to work on them. And I think that can become uh, <clears throat> our greatest skills as well. And then I'd say, and the last thing is just to love your commission <clears throat> that God gives to you. Uh, and you dealt with that very well this afternoon uh, in the council about what our purpose is. And I look and I see back in our text where he says for, in verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world and bring it forth the fruit. And I think keep in mind what you're about, your purpose, lead people. And I've always said two good purposes for every church, glorify God, evangelize the world. Everything kind of comes under that umbrella of glorifying God, number one, and evangelizing the world. And as we evangelize the world, we glorify the Lord. But with all of our heart, let us pray that God will use each of us for the work of the Lord in ministering, but most of all for Pastor Tim. And I remind us, by the way, and all of you folk, you be sure you keep praying diligently for Pastor Tim and Kayla and uh, your pastor and each one, staff members, to pray for them because it is vitally important in the work of the ministry to keep the unity, the oneness that is there. So well, I don't know if I agree with that. You know what? Your own spouse doesn't agree with you on everything. So how do you think all the pastors are going to agree? I mean, so, hey, we just love each other. We just kind of keep on going and uh, serve the Lord as we ought. <clears throat> but to keep in mind church planting the ultimate goal of being able to see those churches get started and see more of our men called into ministry and trained and equipped to, to be able to go out as well. <clears throat> so concerning ministry, it's vitally important for all of us, <clears throat> but especially for a young pastor and wife in the ministry. I remind you <clears throat> to be sure that you keep a love in your heart for the challenge that is there to be faithful. For the charter, stay in the Word of God. To love your companion that God has so wonderfully given you and uh, blessed you with. And to love the congregation, the people. Don't ever walk away from them, but love them to whatever concern they might have. And love your commission that God has given to you as part of the ministry and to continue working and doing your part in leading a church for the Lord. And I say, as you, as you fall in love with all of these things and continue that love going, as I know you already have for all those things, you'll be able to see God's hand of blessings to be on you always. And I remind us again that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to him. Amen. It's God's church. Right. We are simply ministers yeah. to be used of God for the ministry, for the sake of the people, building them up that they might be used of God to go out into the harvest fields that are ripe and ready, waiting for someone to come and tell them about Jesus and establish more churches. Let's pray for all of the folk here at Volusia County Baptist Church to continue to pray for Pastor Tim and his wife as they serve the Lord and they give their all to you. Father in heaven.